Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar, Practical Applications of Induction Heating for Remanufacturing. I am Amanda Harmoning, I'm an admin assistant here at AERA and I will be helping moderate today's event with my colleague Rob Monroe. Hey everyone, yeah Rob Monroe here. So I look after membership and technical development with AERA and like Amanda mentioned, uh, we're both going to be in the background so we're going to help answer any questions that you've got throughout the uh, presentation. So just a couple quick slides to go through here before we bring John and Adam on. Um, what we've got, uh, if some of you are really interested in learning some more technical information, we've got the AERA has put on an Engine Professional podcast. And uh, this is really, really well done. We've got Steve Fox and Chuck Lynch, they're techs over at, uh, at AERA, and they're doing the podcast. And we've got uh, six episodes up right now. So the sixth episode that we just finished was on... Uh, We've got fasteners and, and clamping force, proper use of torque yield head bolts and today's engines and that kind of thing. Simply just go to this web address right here and that'll take you to our podcast section of our website and then you're able to, uh, to have a listen to those. I know the guys just finished recording episode seven. Uh, that's going to be anything related diesel. So uh, they brought on Dave. Uh, Dave is one of our techs, Dave Hagen over at AERA, and uh, they're talking about diesel engines. So that's there for you to listen to as well. The other thing I want to mention too is, so there's five of us that are working at AERA in the tech department. And one of your biggest benefits for membership is to take advantage of, of what we can provide for you as far as the resources and, and, the, and the vast amount of library and stuff that we have. So I would say over 50% of our calls right now are have been diesel related. Uh, the diesels are, are really sort of a lot of the shops that we have as members are working on a lot of diesel engines now. So uh, there's a lot of information that we have, you know, it can be anything from injection pump timing. Yeah, you may be looking for a procedure to put injector tubes in or something like that. This is all information that we can provide for you. And, you know, yeah, anybody that's been on before, you've heard me say this before, you know, the idea of the tech department is to save you time and money. And we do that by, you know, so you're probably sitting there and you're trying to find the information you're looking for in a, in a manual or you're online let us do all that work for you. We have the info and we can get it to you within 30 minutes. So it'll uh, it'll save you some time. It'll keep you on the shop floor and making money like like what you should be there doing and, and let, let us take care of that kind of information for you. All right, one last slide here before we bring up, uh, before bringing on John and Adam on. This is a new manual for us. The tech department uh, had a chance to edit this manual and this is written by Mike Mavergan and Randy over at CWT Industries had a big part in this manual. And there's not another manual like this out there. There's, you know, anybody that has done any balancing work before in the shop knows that it's, it's kind of a bit of a mystery in a way. It's, there's not a lot of information out there. So this manual, there's over 100 pages. Uh, it, it's all color. There's things in there. There's engine theory. There's bob weight setup. There's under over balance. You literally, if you've never balanced a day in your life, you could read this manual and you could be on the balancer and doing your thing. And I'd also mention with this manual, if you've been balancing, it doesn't matter if you've been balancing for 40 years, I can assure you once you've had a look at this manual, there is gonna be some information there that's gonna be well worth the read. So that's there for you as well. Another great advantage of being a member of AERA, we're gonna have mailed this to you. You should have received this already. As well as if you're not a member, you do have the opportunity, you can purchase this manual. So just let us know and we can help you out there. So. What I'll do right now is I'm going to bring on uh, John Lorman and Adam Morrison, and John will be your presenter today. He's, he's going to be presenting, and they're from Ajax Taco Magna Thermic, and they're going to talk to you about a process and about uh, some different ideas and, and things that in the shop that you typically don't see. I mean, uh, this type of process that they're going to talk to you about is, is, is fairly new for a lot of our shops. So I'm looking forward to this presentation today, and... Uh, what we'll do is we'll bring John and Adam on. And so John and how are you guys doing today? How's it going? Good, how are you and Rob and Amanda? Thanks for having us. You betcha, yeah. And hey, it's going great for me as well. Like John said, thanks for having us. Looking forward to sharing our uh, wealth of knowledge for this uh, niche market. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone for taking the time out of your day uh, again to attend this webinar. Thanks again to Rob and Amanda for hosting us. And they want to give us uh, the opportunity to share our inducting heating uh, technology uh, with all of you. Uh, just to share some background information about myself. 
I have over 16 years of experience working uh, in the induction heating industry. I uh, started out fabricating inductors in the shop, uh, then working with different and various positions um, in induction. And then the last six years, I've been with Ajax Taco Magnathermic, uh, where I've served as our national field sales engineer for our low power products division. And I am able to cover all of North America um, along with our regional sales managers. So, again, also on the panel with me today is Adam Morrison, who is our product manager. He has almost 30 years of industrial heating experience, and all of these are with uh, have been with Ajax Taco. Oops. Just to give you some background information, uh, we are um, part of Park Ohio Holdings. Uh, we're a global company. For 25 locations in 20 different countries. Uh, we've been in the industrial heating business for over 100 years. So we're not just a fly-by-night company. Uh, we've been here for a long time. Uh, Park, Ohio was also um, publicly traded on the NASDAQ. Um, they do almost 2 billion per year, uh, whereas Ajax Taco is a company we do about approximately 200 million annually. The history uh, of induction, actually induction is an old technology, although some of us are discovering it you know, for the first time. Uh, the creator of the electromagnetic induction uh, was Michael Faraday uh, back in 1831. And then also Dr. Northrop back in 1918, uh, we actually, we can trace our 103 years of lineage back to. Uh, he created the first wireless uh, fireless furnace for melting lead shots uh, used for ammunition. When he tried to go get this uh, patent, it was deemed inoperable. Uh, so he had to prove his theory to the patent examiner. He uh, used an ordinary lamp cord. Uh, he wrapped this around several turns around an earthenware pot, then puts a piece of metal inside of there. Um, he then energized the furnace, and then uh, the melt, turning the, uh, the metal red, and then white, and then finally into a molten state. And then from there, he was able to prove his theory, and then he also created uh, Ajax Electrothermic Corporation. Placing the material in the proximity of varying or alternating electromagnetic field. Well, we can demonstrate this by it works just like a transformer. The picture on the left, put your electrical current through the primary. On the left here, it creates an electrical field illustrated by the purple lines of magnetic flux, which then creates a proportional current in the secondary winding on the other side heating up that part. Uh, like on the right, we're going to show you which, um, the induction coil, which is um, portrayed on this, the yellow uh, helix, and that is working as your primary. Creating the purple. Induction is um, superior technology. Uh, this is especially compared to flame, furnace, uh, and resistive heating. It's uh, super fast. It can go from room temperature to thousands of degrees in just a matter of seconds. It's extremely precise. Uh, it's very controllable, very repeatable. Uh, we have confidence in our equipment once we are able to set parameters. We have these in there. It's, we're extremely reliable. And is able to run uh, thousands and thousands of cycles over and over again. And again, some of the common misconceptions uh, uh, about induction. Um, some of this is, well, if you don't need heat metal, um, induction can be used on any material that can carry an electrical current. Uh, some of these examples are copper, aluminum, brass, uh, titanium. This is actually for a hip replacement, which I was uh, the proud uh, recipient of in October. And then also uh, we have you know, gold and even glass in a molten state. Uh, the temperatures, uh, something induction can only reach 13 to 1400 degrees F. Again, not true. Uh, induction can reach any temperature uh, up to the vapor point. Uh, the picture here on your right is a, a picture of heating tungsten. It's heated to approximately 6,000 degrees F. And this is used for creating uh, welding rods. And again, the most important part is your inductor, your coil. Some people are led to believe that the coil must surround the entire part, as, as you can see by the picture here below. Again, that's totally false. So you get heat from the inside 
of the part, which is here by an ID type coil. Right to the left of this is black part. It's called like a pancake or a flat toil coil to heat one side. You go to there's another coil here where it's two sided. And also we have specialty coils for heating. Maybe some uh, the shape of them be like a bowl, a cup type. Again, these are all designed for specifically for the part geometry and for the application. Now, some of the uh, various induction heating applications, uh, as you can see on top, these are some of our, our sister companies here. And the majority of these applications are found in the foundries, uh, melting, and the forging industries. Um, markets uh, and industry served. Uh, as you can see by this list, you know, we're, all, we're all over the place um, with all these different types of uh, applications here. Uh, as you can see, there's a, there is a common theme with most of these. You can see as the airplanes, uh, tractors, cars, construction equipment, tanks, ships, locomotives. And what do these all have in common? Well, they all have drivetrains, engines, uh, transmissions. So induction is involved in the front end. Uh, with the OEMs and also in the back end with the manufacturing industry. Forestry. Induction has evolved in all aspects of our lives. Bread and butter, this is about 90% of where induction uh, is applied. And as you can see by these examples here, you know, most of these are front end automotive components. The advantages of working uh, with Ajax Taco. Again, we are celebrating our 103rd year uh, in the induction heating uh, industry. Uh, we provide complete engineered solutions you know, to our customers. We're not just giving you some equipment and wishing you well. But we're there from the beginning through FBAs, uh, proving this, these theories, uh, designing these systems and these inductors with you, and then helping you through the production, and then even after the afterlife with the servicing and any other repairs that possibly are needed. Uh, we support you for the life of the equipment. Ajax Taco is, uh, we are thermal process experts. We're still servicing some of this equipment that's been in the industry for over 60 years. Different types of uh, manufacturing applications. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but there's a common uh, theme through these. These are all a common thermal process between items being joined together. Uh, whether it's brazing tubes, uh, curing epoxy, or oil filters, or heating a housing here, or thermal expansion to shrink fit the motor inside there. Power conversion. How does all this work? Well, we're gonna start on the far right with the part. At the end of the day, uh, this is what we are all concerned about, heating this part in order to make money, be it a connecting rod, a valve seat, or a crankshaft. Uh, this just shows the basic building blocks uh, of an induction heating system. Starting with the power supply on, on the left, uh, this one was rated at 480 volts, three phase, 50 hertz, and 11 amps. It is then converted into a single phase output with a much higher current, 1,000 times the frequency, and a lower voltage that goes through the transformer. This in turn magnifies the resistance of the induction heating co coil, which generates the power needed to heat your part, and at the end, it's working about 16, 000, or I'm sorry, about 6,000 amps. And due to all these high currents, we need to water cool these components, as you can see with our water system below here. Now, this is a, an example of our, and this power supply here is actually, of actually air cooled power unit, and we have a, a small family of air cooled units, uh, which are predominant in the uh, induction remand facilities. Hey, John, if I could interject right there just to give somebody an just example. Just a few more. Sure. So skip back one slide if you don't mind. There you go. So the five kilowatt power supply there, when I talk about five kilowatts, just to give you some perspective, that is about the equivalent of three hair dryers in, in, a, in a single box. It actually runs off 480 volts. But to give you some perspective of three hair dryers, everybody can relate to how much that is. But to heat this part, 
to give you some perspective, those three hair dryers could heat a half inch 13 hex nut from room temperature to 2000 degrees in approximately six, seven seconds. So it's three hair dryers, but we put it in a very concentrated area. So with the induction heating, the non-contact method of heating and the current transformation that we do, we can actually heat parts that are uh, metallic or electrically conductive to extreme temperatures in very few seconds. So I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. Just kind of give some perspective on the size of the power that we're dealing with. I'll turn it back over to you, John. Thanks, Adam. These are just some additional uh, system components. This is a larger, this is actually a 25 kilowatt power supply. Again, this is a, an air-cooled unit. You have our water system and our process controls. Uh, these are where we're able to uh, set our parameters. You can store recipes. You're able to ramp up or ramp down your process, or it's even set up to be, you can need to hold the temperatures for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of temperature. We can do all that and much, much more um, when we're building process controllers to fit whatever your needs are. Uh, the remote work head here, this is our, we call our, our handheld transformer. It's connected to the power supply. This is the housing here. We got these thumb, thumb switches and what they're, Ready to go with it. I'm sorry about that. They're going to turn the power on and heating this inductor, which is to the far right. It was actually inside of here, locating it into the work head. Induction valves to removal is by far our most popular uh, reman application. Um, the example here on the left is blue. The cyan is going to be your valve seat. Uh, the heating duct is the yellow and this gray area. Is we're putting all our heat into these valve seats. So we're specifying the heat. Once the heat is applied to the valve seat, it tries to expand radially. And due to the mass of that cylinder head, it actually grows axially. And then when it cools, it shrinks right radially. And then it's going to leave uh, the spacing here, which is outlined by these black marks, black lines here. And after that, it's actually just um, easily pulled out with, with minimal force. Um, there's a 3D cutout of this, uh, the inductor going into the valve seat and into the cylinder head. You can see this line down here. This is actually our, the valve guide pin, which just goes into the valve guide of the cylinder head and helps us align the inductor into place. These are a couple of videos uh, showing this process of uh, removing the pressed in valve seats. Um, the first one's going to be an aluminum head. This is from a V6 passenger car. And then as, as you can see, once it goes on, the heat is act, selectively heating primarily just that valve seat. And once it's off, it's off. Someone's going to try to get their giant fingers in there and pull them easily pull it out. But again, we're using our fingers to show the ease of them coming out. Again, this is what we are recommending. You know, customers use handheld tooling, especially for production. The next side, this is a cast iron large bore uh, locomotive head. Uh, the flute pen is there just showing when the uh, coil is energized. Again, selective focused heating, just heating the valve seat. I want to push this going a little bit further. See how matter just a matter of seconds how hot this is getting. And then as soon as the power's off, you can see it cool fairly quickly. And then once it becomes cool, cool to the touch, we're going to be going in there and removing the valve seat. And then John, in production, well, well, they're going to cut. Go ahead. So in that video, I think anyone here that's been involved with uh, valve seat removal and large bore engines can appreciate what was just displayed there. So. In a matter of seconds, that valve seat was heated from room temperature to about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. The cylinder head itself remained cool. We actually are focusing the heat only in that seat. And because of that, the seat is like John explained earlier in the previous slide of the illustration, that seat is trying to grow um, radially, but it's constrained by the cold head. So what happens is it actually is forced to grow along its length or actually and then when it cools, it's been plastically deformed, and that's what allows it to be removed with minimal force. 
So like I said, but I'll keep in mind that that entire process only takes about from heating to cooling to extraction, about 30 seconds. And um, that's where you know a lot of the cost savings will come in from uh, core retention, uh, labor reductions, safety, and so forth. So again, I'll turn it back over to John. Sure. Thanks, Adam. And in production, uh, just to piggyback on that, they're heating all these seats right in a row. So they're gonna go in there. Uh, as you can see on the left, there's uh, about what, 12 seats in this head here. They're gonna go heat all 12 of them, push them aside, let them cool and go on to the next set. Uh, so once they cool, the seats are done. They're not gonna need any more attention. Uh, they're not gonna shrink anymore or, or expand um, at all after that. And the various you know, sizes and types of valve sleeves, as you can see in this picture, you know, they go from approximately you know, one inch in diameter, the two to three inches in diameter. You see that the variance and the thicknesses, uh, the heights. Uh, this tall one here is actually a water-cooled uh, valve seat. We got to make sure. I think you've seen, and I'll show you some pictures of it of the coil. We got to heat the top end and the bottom end. Uh, we, we try to heat the whole thing. It actually uh, separates right in the middle. And probably the most important thing is Adam was talking about earlier. Again, this is focused heating. Um, and by showing up this thermal engine, we're heating this valve seat up to 13 to 1400 degrees uh, while the head remains under 200 degrees. Uh, we had customers that were actually weren't um, needed to prove this theory out for their their managers, um, making sure there was no uh, change or no no damage to the actual head. So they had thermal couples set up all over top of the the cylinder head. We heated all uh, the seats in succession. They took all this um, information back to their their guys. They did all their studies, and what they found out is the head is not affected at all through induction heating. It remains the same. Um, the old ways versus the new ways. Um, using flame combust combustion, uh, we've seen the majority of our customers that there is just created more damage than it did uh, for removing the seats, so, which led to them scrapping heads or having to repair these heads and going back in there. Uh, again, induction is selective heating. It's much faster, safer, and more efficient. And I would see the advantages of induction in the remanufacturing industries. Yeah. Why choose induction? Well, as all companies try to do when you're purchasing any kind of equipment, what are you looking for? A favorable return on investment uh, so you can justify your costs. So. And how usually a cost, um, costs. Uh, reducing the labor, that's what we're increasing production, uh, and then also improves the core retention. We're eliminating scrapping or we're having to go back and repair these heads or these parts. And then for the operator, we're you know, improving safety and it's much more ergonomic. Uh, for your operators. Now for our sample and innovative ones, um, you know, for disassembly and removal, again, we talked about the valve seats, uh, uh, water guides, large cylinder heads, spanner nuts, uh, cone and removal, and some of the shrink footing application, lifting rods, bearing braces and gears. And I'm going to go over a few of these in a little, in a little more detail through these next uh, several slides. Shrink foot applications. Um, for heating the connect, connecting rods um, to insert the wrist pin, or for heating these gears, um, expanding the hole uh, so it can fit onto the shaft. So the video on the right is going to show you um, the shrink fitting of the connecting rods. Uh, this is a process that takes approximately maybe 10 seconds for the heat time, whereas the, how they're doing it now, it takes approximately two to three minutes for them to get this process completed. So operator puts it in there, they hit the start button. That's our heating. She's getting her next part into place. As you can see in the back here, you can see that get red hot in just a matter of seconds it's going to stop automatically she puts it in place inserts the wrist pin she's on to the next one um, hey john we yes. seem to be having a little bit of a bandwidth issue so scroll back to that slide there and let that video play for just a few moments if it can catch up 
There you go. So parts inserted, get to your next part of position. Again, these is right here uh, to the left is your the process controller. It's on a, a set, so it's set for a, a certain amount of kilowatts and a certain amount for seconds. So once you hit that start button, it's going to be repeating that process over and over again. Other types of remand applications uh, for removing nuts and bolts. Uh, either they're corroded or they're on, um, used on it. Engine blocks, uh, turbos, uh, spanner nuts, uh, anywhere we can get a position. Uh, as you can see, we have our handheld transformers in there. This is how So manipulate and getting them into position uh, where having a stationary transformer in a position to remove these or heat these uh, bolts. One of the uh, successful applications we had for removing the spanner nuts, this is done on a torque six transmission, um, heating approximately three inch uh, spanner nut. Uh, uh, the process is melting the thread locking compound and the heat time is approximately 50 seconds. And if you can see on there, there's going to be some blue uh, paint, which is called Tempelac. Now, this paint is rated at various different temperatures. And once uh, it reaches that temperature it's rated at, it's going to disappear, uh, dissolves. And allow it, so once we've dissolved, we know we know what temperatures and what time it takes us. This helps us set our parameters and putting it into our process controller. So this is a video of this process. Okay, yeah, and just checking the temperature, it's about 80 degrees. He's gonna insert the inductor of the spanner nut, turn the power on. Again, you can see the blue line here. It goes all the way down to the, sh the shaft as well. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. And you can see it start to smoke a little bit here. And then in just a couple seconds, you're gonna start seeing, you know, the blue start to dissolve. So we know we're Just reaching our- note there, John, is that that tan colored ring is the induction heating coil. If you wanna pause it there for just a moment. That's the induction heating coil. So that device, that item there is doing nothing more than creating an electromagnetic field. We're passing high frequency current through that and it's creating an electromagnetic field. And the electromagnetic field is actually uh, permeating that spanner nut. And the spanner nut now has electrical currents flowing through it, just like a transformer would. And that current flowing through it is causing that part to generate its own internal heating, kind of like a microwave, not quite, but similar. And, that, and that's through, so if you look at your, uh, let's say like an old fashioned uh, electric space heater, everybody's seen those things glow bright red and feel the warmth coming off of them. So that bright red color, is coming from the current flowing through that wire, which is typically a nichrome, a nickel chrome wire. It's a high resistance, high temperature wire. And that current flowing through it causes it to build up heat. It, it, you know, it's trying to shove too many electrons through it and it's causing heat generation. So in this case right here, we're creating, again, we're creating an electromagnetic field with three hair dryers. Keep in mind what you're seeing and going on right here is three hair dryers worth of power. And it's heating that spanner nut, which weighs approximately, probably about two pounds. And we're heating it from room temperature to 500 degrees Fahrenheit in approximately 30 to 40 seconds. And then again, as John mentioned, you'll see that that blue paint, uh, what we call Templac, it's a temperature sensitive paint. You'll see it melt. So that gives us an indication when we finally soak that temperature all the way through. And then at that point, you will actually uh, release or dissolve or melt, degrade the uh, thread locking compounds that make those nuts such a challenge to get off. But I wanted to point out key here is that that loop there that tan colored loop is the induction heating coil and there's nothing coming from that in the form of physical heat it is only an electromagnetic wave that is causing that spanner nut to generate its own internal heating again i'm sorry john let's turn it back okay thank you again it's see that paint dissolving when it soaks all the way through that spanner nut and again the, there's also blue paint on the shaft here see we're our, again we're focus heating on the nut it's not affecting the shaft so we're going to go ahead and check the temperatures we're going to check it in another spot it's going to be roughly 504 degrees 
Uh, for this application, the customer supplied us with their own tooling. Let's speed this along a little bit. Once it's cool, he's able to put the tooling jig on there. And then he's, uh, well, it should be easy, but it's not too easy for him uh, just to twist it around. So it's going to take him a little while, but I'm going to speed it up for him again until he gets the hang of it here. There we go. But again, the key here to note there, John, is that basic torque, or the only torque that was required to remove that nut was the torque that was available from that person's arm strength only. We didn't have to use a breaker bar or anything else like that. Correct. And again, you can see the blue paint still here. Again, we're not heating that uh, to 500 degrees whatsoever. Another example is uh, axle carrier housings to uh, install bearing races. It's going to be about three to four different uh, sizes of these housings. So each of these we had to build the, or these uh, customized tooling to align the inductors to go inside of each housing assembly. Um, as you can see on the far left, this is our handheld transformer. And the, this is the housings. We got the thumb switches to turn the power on. And again, they're lined up. So the coils is going to be in the same place every time. Uh, this is going to be a, a video of the actual carrier housing. Uh, this is on our our customized carts. So these house carts are uh, housed to hold a complete induction system. So you got the power supplies, as you can see. You got the water system, uh, the process controller, and then your cable here for the the handheld transformer. So as you can see, it's got it in place. He's going to line it up with. These, these pinholes here. Once it's in place, he's going to hit up, click on the thumb switches. And that's going to trigger the process controller, which has the time power and time programmed in there. And there's also, I believe on this one, there was a red, yellow, and green light on there. So the operator knows uh, once the power is on and once the power turns off. This also shows the meter readings uh, of the power that's going in there. Now I'm just going to stop this for just one quick second here. Uh, you can see this part here. This is for aligning and pressing the, the part in there uh, with this orange handle here. Um, what the previous thing we're doing was, they had, see this hammer in the background? It was, they put this um, part over the bearings. They, they were pounding these uh, bearing races in there. It was a very arduous task for them, uh, resulting in one of the operators needing uh, rotator cuff surgery. And this... Um, Transformer with this housings, and it looks fairly heavy and cumbersome. But there's also um, a hydraulic pulley system, so it's easily to maneuver this tooling. It's very ergonomic. I got one back a little bit here. We can watch it a little bit more. We're going to again to get lining it up. Once it's in position, fix it on. This is very good. I'll keep putting this in perspective. What you see there is approximately 10 hair dryers worth of power. Again, this shows all that the meter reading, this is great information. Um, in case there's any issues or any faults, you're not sure about what's happening. Uh, this is great information for our engineers and our staff to go back and see what how the machine is operating and what we can do to to fix things if needed. We're going to hello once it's ready, just easily pulls it out. And that's guy's going to put a shim in there, the frozen bearing race in. Put it in position, and he's done. There's no need for hammering, uh, no other types of process uh, that needs to be done with this application. Um, Brazing and soldering. And soldering. Uh, brazing is an excellent application uh, for induction. We have thousands and thousands of applications that we have done uh, for brazing. Some examples are for you know, brazing fuel and hydraulic lines. Uh, induction can also be automated. That's just kind of a two for one video here um, showing how easily um, it, these, uh, the inductors can be indexed into the part. This is our a two turn uh, earmuff inductor. 
Uh, it's engineered, so the field, the magnetic field is going to uh, encapsulate the area by only using two areas, but it's able to brace and put an easy, even heating process around this whole part without and circulating the part. So they just heated there. It's going to be indexing to the next part. And just a matter of seconds, it's going to get red hot to the, again, these are all in timed applications. Comes out and they're ready to go to the next. Another app shake applications are for uh, removing the coatings, which is a process of removing uh, non metallic material from a metal substrate. So we're breaking the adhesive bond between the rubber and the metal for these. And some of the examples that would be done in the applications were for uh, forklift wheels. And the same principle is being used for removing paint, uh, tar, uh, grease, and oil. Again, these are our uh, custom fabricated mobile carts, and they're designed to house a complete induction system and with only using one electrical connection. So these have the ability to go from work cell to work cell and also have the ability to you know, change the different applications just by simply um, changing out the inductor or the tooling can go from doing, you know, moving bell seats to another application for brazing or, or whatever. Uh, the induction coils, these are by far the most important part uh, of your induction heating system. Again, these are specifically designed uh, for each part and each application. These are done by highly skilled engineers, and the guys that are manufacturing these are they're very talented and they're pretty much artists for what they could uh, perform. Um, the three types of manufacturing are basic uh, brazing inductors, uh, machine inductors, as you can see by the ones for uh, valve seat removal, then also uh, 3D printed and added manufacturing, which is another reason why you need to choose a reputable induction heating supplier. Hey, John, if I'll step in here as well, um, one of the things that, you know, these we call these inductors, uh, and again, I know we got a lot of people in our audience today who may not be as intimately familiar with induction heating as we are. And sometimes we take it for granted. But what you see here is what would be analogous to a heating element. Um, those, again, the top three pictures are three examples of various quote unquote heating elements, if you will. But keep in mind, as I said earlier, they do not produce any physical heat. These are actually more synonymous in actual the way they work to an electromagnet. But the difference is, is if with an electromagnet, it's typically one polarity. This is an AC signal or an AC current that's throwing through there. So the current is reversing directions several thousand times per second, and it's causing the magnetic field to flip positive and negative several times per second. So with inside a metallic, particularly iron materials, there's uh, the magnetism comes from what we call magnetic domains. And then when we flip the polarity, say, south to north, those magnetic domains align in that direction. And then we flip it in the other direction, say from north to south, again, they will reverse their direction there. And they physically move, they physically move inside the alloy. So if you were to take your hands and you rub them together, you feel a little bit of warmth. But if you rub them faster, you feel more warmth. That's what's going on. These, these tools here that we call electromagnets, or, or actually would be synonymous to, in most laymen as heating elements, or more like said, uh, variable electromagnets. So each one of those tools there, you'll notice the one on the top left there has four turns on it. That's the coils like you'd find in a transformer. The one in the middle, you see the copper at the top mid body there, that's got two loops on it. Again, that's your loops on your transformer. And the one on the right is only got a single loop, but you'll notice it's actually profiled to a very complex shape. And that's actually 3D printed with a laser uh, out of copper. And all of this, the reason we spend a little bit of time here is this is the most important part of the induction heating system. If you do not have a properly engineered induction heating coil, you've got nothing more than a hot water heater or a poorly efficient process that's heating the wrong parts, that kind of stuff. So uh, you can find a lot of induction heating companies on the internet that will sell you induction heaters, but very few of them actually understand how to engineer and supply you with engineered tooling to make it work. So make sure if you ever pick a uh, induction heating supplier. Pick one that is actually a process expert, one that has induction heating coil manufacturing and engineering and cap uh, manufacturing capabilities. 
Um, but so, like I said, I just wanted to add that in there real quick because, like I said, we call them inductors. We take it for granted. Kind of look at them as heating elements. It's custom designed to heat the uh, required profile, the exact profile that this needs to be heated for somebody's unique process. Thanks, John. Thanks, Adam. And also, know that the All these inductors are all, all water cooled. The inductor, again, like Adam was saying, the inductor does not get uh, magnetics, finite element analysis, FEA. Uh, induction is very predictable. Uh, Ajax Taco, we have our own proprietary software, and process engineers uh, perform these FEAs. Uh, we can predict how induction will perform without physically heating um, the actual parts. Uh, further supports and gives us the high confidence on what we quote, what we sell, and then obviously what we deliver. This example here shows heating two zones of an OEM torsion bar um, using thermocouples. Uh, we can then plot this data. And then share it with our customer in high confidence. Induction has always, uh, you know, been a green technology. Uh, it does not burn traditional fossil fuels. It's a very clean and non-polluting you know, process. It converts approximately 90% of its energy. It's a useful heat uh, compared to like batch furnishes was about, approximately about half that. And it conserves materials, uh, reduces uh, energy consumption, mitigates waste. Also delivers a high uh, ROI or equivalent quality items. Free feasibility lab trials. Um, this has been a really a great tool uh, for uh, new to induction or have a part or a process you want to try, and if it's a good candidate for induction, uh, we'll. With our over 100 years of experience, there's probably a good chance that we you know, may have already tried it already. So uh, we've done this a lot with our customers. Again, it's, it's a great tool, especially in the free manufacturing industry. Uh, we have customers send us their heads or, um, so we can re remove their valve states on their actual parts. So it gives us the opportunity to share the results with the customers on their actual prototype. or at their actual production part. So, and then we also invite them to come in uh, to see the results in person. We are here to be a, a resource you know, to all our customers. Our, um, our spare parts are our field service. We have, um, we house over a $1 million uh, in spare parts inventory. Uh, we do this, so we're constantly uh, supporting our customers and for minimizing uh, their potential downtime, uh, again, no customer wants to be down ever. Uh, right, our inventory is so large due to having many older units, uh, again, production. Again, we are still servicing some equipment that's been running uh, for over 60 years. In our field service engineers, we have uh, over 40 uh, in North America alone. And oh, globally, I think we have approximately 200 or so. This concludes our webinar again. Uh, thank you for taking the time to participate in this with us and again to AER. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're able to provide you with some new and interesting information, uh, possibly uh, you know, sparking an idea for a new or existing process for induction heating. So please feel free to ask any questions or feel free to email me uh, with any interest. Super, yeah, no. Just, yeah, uh, like, any of these or any other types of uh, induction heating applications. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, no, thanks, Adam. Um, I apologize, everybody. We had a little bit of an internet glitch here through some of the webinars. So some of you were kind of, John was a little bit in and out throughout the webinar. So what I would recommend is, um, I, I'm sure these guys would be more than you know happy to help. Uh, I'm sure even if, if you wanted a copy of the presentation, they, they, they'd be, you know, if you email them, I'm, I'm sure they could send you copies of it or or at least help you out there. So everybody that's on today, I mean, I recommend just jot down John's email address there. 
And uh, again, I do apologize for for some of the glitches with the internet. And uh, again, John and Adam will will be more than happy to to help out there and and get some information over to you. So there are uh, a couple of questions, guys. If you if you got a minute, so we've got one question. Uh, this gentleman's asked, you know, is there portable tools to use like more for mobile applications? You know, automotive shops just wondering just how mobile friendly is some of this tooling. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so it can be mobile. In general, with induction and commercial induction heating systems, most of them are stationary systems. So this is a very good question. The majority of, this, of the equipment that's manufactured, sold, engineered, so forth by Ajax Taco and similar companies is actually sold, as John said, on the front end for manufacturing these parts at the OEM level, making the new parts. Uh, so it's just in recent years that induction heating, just like everything else has gotten a little bit more compact, more efficient, a little bit more portable, that we've started exploring portable applications. Uh, for instance, uh, we have a product line called the Autotron. That, that's A-U-T-O-T-R-O-M. Uh, it is a, uh, pardon me for running this in the ground, but it is a two hair dryer rated unit. It's 3000 watts. Um, that is used a lot of times in collision repair shops, uh, mechanic shops, but it's 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 it is portable. It weighs about 20 pounds. It's eight by eight by 15 inches. Weight uh, runs off of 110 or 220 volts, 100% air cooled. So it's good for the occasional person who's wanting to heat an occasional seized nut, uh, seized tie rod in. Uh, perhaps use it to remove a bonded component such as a side molding, uh, an automotive glass uh, that's bonded to us, you know, a, a, a pinch weld in the chassis. So there are availabilities out there, but in the, in regards to the reman world, um, the most portable system is the five kilowatt system. And it can, these can be cart mounted and they are uh, similar to the size of a, uh, like many of us may have at home in our, in our man caves, uh, our, um, our little home welders. So the five kilowatt, again, three to four hair dryers worth of power is about the size of a typical hobbyist welder. And they can be put on a cart. And, and with those systems, you change out the heating elements, quote unquote, the heating elements, the inductors, you change them out, you change the application. And those can begin to use for all the things you've seen shown today, wrist pin heating, nut and bolt heating, uh, maybe even small forgings for anybody that may be out there that's just a hobbyist that wants to you know, try to forge a knife blade or, or bend some steel, that kind of stuff. So yes, they are portable. Um, Historically speaking, though, most induction heating systems are three-phase powered systems, 230-volt or 480-volt three-phase powered systems. But again, if you take a look at like the Autotron line, uh, you will see some single-phase power applications. So they can be portable. What I would recommend to anyone is, again, to get a hold of John Lorman. Uh, his email is there and talk to him about it. And we as a team will review your needs and we'll, we'll give you an honest answer of what can be provided. Just like give you a quick comment on that Adam as well as I travel um, with a five kilowatt uh, unit in the back of my my small SUV so that's that's the whole system uh, the water system the power supply the, the transformer everything fits right in back there I'm able to go do some demonstrations uh, on site at times okay yep super guys um, here's another question for you does the induction coil always need to encircle the part being heated, or can the coil transfer its energy outward to a part to expand it? I got to step in here. Um, John has a slide that actually demonstrates that we talked about some of that. Um, go on back another couple slides, John. We show the uh, ID coil, the OD coil, the pancake coil. It's more towards the front of your presentation. There you go, right there, right there. So, it's a great question because it's a common misconception that you have to fully surround the part being heated. Um, with induction heating coils, uh, heating elements, we can design them in a lot of different ways. Now, there's a lot of science to it, don't get me wrong. So uh, you see the black and gray com the inductor right in the center of that group there. That's what we would refer to commonly as a pancake inductor. It looks like a stove eye. Heats in much the same way as a stove eye. And we can make those things as small as one inch or as large as a bus if you wanted to. It just depends on the power required for the application. Uh, the one in the upper left there that's got the green materials on it, uh, that is what we would call a channel coil. It's like a C-shaped or a U-shape. 
it heats from two sides. So if you have a hard, if you can't access all the way around the part, you can actually slide this over and heat, you know, from two sides. It's always best if you can go completely around the part, as is the inductor that's shown on the bottom right there. That's what we would refer to as a solenoid coil. That's the most efficient, uh, most simple to build, a lowest cost option. But you don't always have to go all the way around the part. And in the in the uh, image in the upper right hand corner of that group, that's what we would refer to as an ID inductor. Uh, that inductor, as you can see, would slip nicely into the ID of an axle housing, so that you could expand the bearing area of an axle housing to make it easy to insert a new bearing. Uh, and then, of course, the one on the left would be somewhat of an extreme. Uh, that is the as a variant of that pancake inductor, but you can see it's kind of got of a dome shape or a beehive shape. And that was custom engineered for a very unique shape part uh, product. Uh, just to throw it out there, if anybody is a scientist or a mad scientist, if you will, um, some of you may be familiar with Sterling engines. You know, they're heat-driven engines. Uh, that inductor there was actually used to simulate the sunshine on a solar-powered Sterling engine so that they could do life cycle testing around the clock, not have to be limited to daylight hours. So. Uh, great question. You don't have to go all the way around the part to heat them. You can go inside, outside, two side, one side, whatever works best for you. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question for you guys. Um, gentleman's asked, where can one purchase that, I guess it's that temple like paint that you were using in that one slide that you had when you were showing the heat. Where can you purchase that paint? You can actually purchase it from a company called Temple, T-E-M-P-L. It's uh, You can Google it. You'll find it quite right quickly. Uh, they manufacture that material in temperatures from as low as like 100 degrees all the way up to maybe a couple thousand degrees. Uh, we've, and we use it. It's, it's a great uh, setup tool. Um, you obviously don't have to touch the part with a thermocouple. You don't have to have an expensive IR camera. Um, it's got basically a 100 degree range. So if it's rated, let's say, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll start to discolor, turn maybe slightly darker at, say, 50 degrees. It will melt at 100, which is your dead on temperature. And then it's like 150, it starts to burn and char. So it's a great tool. But if you'll go and just look up Temple, uh, I believe it is T I M P L E, if I remember correctly. Or there it is, T I M P I L. And uh, Google that, you'll find it. It's, um, it's a material that we've used for decades in our industry. Excellent. Now that's good information. Thanks, Adam. So what we're going to do now, um, just in respect with everybody's time, we do like to keep the webinars really close to an hour. Um, and uh, any of the questions that we've got still, we're going to get those over to both John and Adam. And what we can do is have them answer them for you. Again, we do apologize for uh, for some of the, the internet glitches today. If if, uh, if if you want, like I said, if you want to get a hold of John or Adam, go ahead and contact them. Um, there's lots of good information there. They can help you out. Guys, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, that was a great presentation. It's it's information that we just, again, most of our shops are just not used to this technology yet, and it was good to get a, a really good tour and uh, and be able to see what it is you guys do, how you do it, and how this process can be applied. So I, I thank you for your time. That was, that was well done, for sure. Well, thank you for having us. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go back to Amanda, and uh, what we'll do is we'll wind things up. So, hey, Amanda. Hey Rob, we'll make this real quick so you guys can get on with your day. As I mentioned, you will get an email tomorrow that will contain a link to the recording of today's presentation that is yours to use as you wish. You can pass it along to other people in your organization, rewatch it, make notes, um, whatever you want to do with it. Also, when you leave today, there will be a survey. Please fill it out. Take a moment. Let us know how we're, we're doing. If there's anything special you'd like to see in the future. Uh, we do go through and read all those comments, and you can also put any additional questions you may have for our presenters today in there, and we will pass them along to them, as Rob mentioned. Lastly, you can see our contact information is listed there. You can reach anyone at the AERA team by calling 815-526-7600. Uh, if you have any questions for our techs, they can be reached at tech at AERA.org. Any questions for me or anything you want me to pass along, go ahead and email me at amanda at aera.org or just reply to any emails you get regarding our webinars. I do get those as well. And then lastly, you'll see Rob's is there across the bottom, rob at aera.org. 
So again, thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to listen today, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.